Hello and welcome back to the Sharks World. Today's video is going to cover an article that sheds some light on how we look at shark evolution. It makes sense that sharks would be studied extensively for anything related to evolution since they're older than most things today. Trees, birds, Godzilla. What? But this article notes that methods we've used in the past or lack thereof, may be limiting our understanding of shark genetics, morphology, and behavior over time. As always in my videos, I will leave a link to the main source article in the description below. Please, do yourself a favor and give it a thorough read. You won't be disappointed. With that out of the way, let's dive right in. Grab you a cold drink, pull up a chair to the table, and let's take a look at a new understanding of shark evolution. So, before we begin, I need to define a few terms that are going to add context to this video. The first one is Nathastone. I know the G fucks you up, but work with it. Nathostome is a term that describes any jawed vertebrae. Sharks, crocodiles, deer, us. If it has a jaw and it's a vertebrae, it's a nathostome. The second is morphology, which is the study of an organism's form and structural features, outward appearance, senses, organs, and so on. Think of it this way. If morphology was a math problem, it would be the organism plus their environment or how their environment shaped said organism equals morphology. And finally, we have phylogenetics. Now while Google says that it is the evolutionary development and diversification of a species, it's actually a lot more than that. Think of the concept of the world tree. The thought process behind it is that every branch, which represents a species, can be traced back to an ancestor. For example, one thing people still get wrong about Megalodon is that they think it was the ancestor of the Great White, which it wasn't. Looking at you, Sharkfest. The Great White evolved from the broad-toothed Mako. However, the Great White and the Megalodon do have a common ancestor called Creta Lamna. The Great White and the Meg would be separate branches that eventually lead back to Creta Lamna going back in time. And Creta Lamna and other sharks would lead back to the first shark ancestor. Now, why are all these terms important? For anyone who knows sharks in evolution well, the answer is obvious. They all come together to help us understand how the concept of a shark came to be. Understanding them from way back to the Paleozoic period to the present day will help us understand ourselves and other parts of nature better and how they come to be. So. To start, the scientists highlight in the article how they studied morphology and behaviors in isolation. This makes sense because science is at its best when it is specific and accurate within context. But one thing that we've failed to do in the past is look at these things together in regards to other species and how sharks interacted with other species behaviors, genetics, and morphologies in addition to their ecosystems. The evolutionary arms race would be an example. This is important for understanding the evolutionary process and potential catalysts for changes. These core fields were never looked at closely when it comes to sharks and their relatives until now, thus hindering our understanding of their evolution. Let me give an example. We know that many different species of sharks have tons of different tooth plants. 
These plans changed over time, but the piece we failed to look at is what animal and environmental pressures caused these tooth plans to arise? What caused the mako shark to end with the teeth it has today? What caused the prey of the mako shark to evolve in a way that influenced the way the mako's teeth developed and how the mako hunted? What environmental factors influence both predator and prey? Now, take that equation and apply it to all 500 plus species of sharks. This is what we can refer to as the dominant mode of selection, and we don't fully understand what selection pressures are influencing the many different and complex adaptations. The best way to understand them is through genetic, morphological, and behavioral studies. So how do those terms fit together within this context? As I've stated in the past, one thing science will often do is use a predictive framework. When there is data we don't have, we make educated assumptions in predictive patterns based on the data that we do have. In the case of this article, we can start by looking at what we know influences phenotypic variations. Natural selection, migrations, mutations, and so on. Natural selection is a big one. Most people think it's survival of the fittest, when in reality, that's only part of the equation. Natural selection means what traits and genetics are selected for during mate selection and reproduction. I recommend the book, The Ape That Understood the Universe, if you want to go more in depth. But to get back to the point, let's take a look at the chart presented in the article. You can see that genetics, morphology, and behavior all influence each other and help us understand the concept of a shark. Separately, these terms were looked at extensively, but when we look at how they interact with each other in regards to sharks and other animals in their lives, it adds a whole new look to the bigger picture. Let's look back at the Megalodon, the Great White, and their common ancestor, Cretolamna. In this context, we know that the Great White and the Meg used to be one species, but what factors caused them to separate and diversify? What environmental and surrounding prey behaviors influenced the Meg to get so big and grow such large teeth? As I've explained in the evolutionary arms race, prey evolved new ways to avoid or deter Cretolamna, so Cretolamna had to change to counter that, the behavior. Size was selected for during mating and reproductive processes, the behavior influencing the genetics. This group of Cretolama grew larger over time and their organs, body shape, and teeth changed, the genetics influencing the morphology. While that was happening, separately, another group of Cretolamna were evolving into the broad tooth mako, and eventually the great white. Every single plant, animal, and environmental aspect of our world changed because their phylogenetics have spent millions upon millions of years reacting and changing because of each other. Going back to the chart I showed earlier, take a species name and put it in the middle of those terms. Now draw a circle around it and add other circles around it representing other species with those terms. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the link we have failed to incorporate in past studies, thus hindering our understanding of shark's evolutionary picture as a whole. I always say that sharks are smart animals. Applying this concept to the idea, we can argue that sharks are smart animals because they hunt smart animals. Dolphins, marlins, seals, octopus, and so on. 
With this understanding in mind, the scientist notes in the article that we have the tools to implement this understanding in future shark studies. All that is lacking is people to do it. So, for any of my shark scientists out there, or people who are genuinely interested in shark evolution like myself, apply this understanding and series of questions next time you come across some interesting shark data. We'll call it the Philo lens. But this is going to be where we end the video. Once again, please go give the main source article a read linked below. It goes into more detail and adds more context to this video. Thank you for once again giving me some of your time, and I'll see you in the next video. Until then.